All right, so here we are. This is the continuation of our cellular respiration lecture series. <laughs> so we're picking up right now with some, some PowerPoint slides, some very important things in the text. So what I want you to do is actually go to Teams or Blackboard and download the PowerPoints. Of course, you all have books and these things are in the books. But these are streamlined versions of figures that are in the textbook. And what I'm going to try to do today with this lecture is take you through the figures and maybe even kind of scribble some notes on them um, and then kind of blend it together with some really cool chalkboard lecture work. So this is going to be a lot of fun and it's going to be rather intense. Uh, with a lot of great information, but again, my job is to make this incredibly complicated process a lot easier for you to follow. So, we're starting right off the bat with glycolysis. So I guess uh, maybe you, it, by now you may have copied these PowerPoint figures, so then you can take your own notes on them. I suppose uh, another way for you to do this would be to actually you know, get a, a pencil and scribble in your book if you want to, but of course a lot of you are thinking of selling your books back, so you're probably not going to go that way. Whatever the case, here we have the big picture. So this is figure 9.9, .9, page 170 and 171. This thing is just stretched across the bottom of two pages in the textbook. And uh, what I've done with this figure is that I've actually taken the two parts and used them together. So we're going to go through this thing kind of systematically and identify really big picture things. I'll point out a few fine details because it's always good to see some of the great work that we've done with our biochemistry. But we really want to just understand what the process of glycolysis is. So the first thing that I want to do is just tell you that glycolysis is a word that we can break down pretty well. We already know the Latin root lysis right here, which means to break apart, and then glyco, we've studied that in, in sugar. You might remember um, seeing glyco prolifically in the carbohydrate section. So this is breaking of sugar. And we're going to start with our sugar over here on the end, and then we're going to go all the way to a three-carbon entity over there. So what I'm going to do is grab a pen. This isn't the greatest pen in terms of thickness, but I want to identify some things here. So there's our friend glucose right here. And look at it. It's alpha glucose. Down, down, up, down. You can see that right there. I'll go to a bigger version of this in a minute. But what I want to do is identify this with the number 6 and then C. So what we, what we see in this, 6C means 6 carbon. And what I want to do is just go all the way through this process and show you that this one, this next one, is also a 6C. We'll look at it in detail in a minute. This one is also a, a 6C, but it's changed somewhat. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This is also a 6C. So we haven't done anything to break, whoops, we haven't done anything to break glucose apart yet. Now we've broken it. This thing up here is a 3C. This thing down here is a 3C. And then from here on out, it's 3C. Now notice, this number right here is going to show up on the entire right side of the diagram. This is the number 2. And what they're telling you in this figure is that we, have, we only have one of each of these per glucose molecule. We start with one glucose, and then we have this split into two three-carbon molecules. And from that point on, the idea would be that each one of these things that are called glyceraldehyde-3-phosphates are going to be going through 
this process. So therefore, per glucose, we've got two. So this means boom, 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 and boom. All of this collectively means two per glucose. And there we are. Okay, so that's, that's all we're going to say with this version. We'll see this one later. We're going to see this one later, and it will be... Um, we'll write different things on it to kind of summarize what we've learned. So here we go. Here is the big first part then. All of this stuff up to the right end here is again 6C. 6C meaning six carbons. Whoops, I'll go back up. Get my pen. Please, give me that pen. There we are. 6C here, that's glucose. You can see this is a molecule that you know very, very well. This guy's got everything that it has. You learned how to draw this weeks ago and hopefully you still remember. Now, what we want to start to focus on, however, is what's going on here. So we have for a molecule of glucose to convert it to glucose 6-phosphate, we actually have to spend one ATP. So I think if I go to my pen, I'm going to use red as I have been using to describe a cost. So, so far we have a, a cost here with this step. Let's write this up here, cost. And our cost is going to be 1 ATP. Of course, I'll write the thing around it like I always do. There we are. We have 1 ATP at this point. And what we did, check this out, we have phosphorylated this thing. Look at that. Sorry about using a mouse as a pen. Phosphorylated that thing. So that's what we did with this ATP, is we've gone from ATP to ADP, and then the phosphate that came off is stuck right there. And now we even name the thing glucose 6-phosphate. Notice also this part right here, enzyme. Every one of every one of these blue circles with numbers represent an enzyme catalyzed reaction step. So this is our first one. It's called hexokinase, right there. All right, so then we have another M enzyme, phosphoglucoisomerase, and of course, you even are familiar with the word isomer. So this thing is going to isomerize this. We had the same business, the same numbers of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, and a phosphate, and we're going to move it around. Look, we went from a six-membered ring to a five-membered ring, a six-ring. It's supposed to be the number six right there, and then a five ring. What I really want you to do when we go through this, this is certainly nothing that you're going to memorize. I want you, when you see this figure, perhaps in an exam, to actually be able to completely interpret what's going on from the figure. So I'm pointing out some of the really important things just to get you familiar to just to get you familiar with this overall process. Okay. So we've done our second enzyme catalyzed step and now we've got a five-membered ring. And then look at this. We are going to have another cost. Here's another cost and that cost is going to be 1 ATP and like before Like before, 
we're going to use that phosphate to phosphorylate this particular substrate. So here, glucose 6-phosphate, it has one phosphate. We are now going to spend one more ATP and get another phosphate. This bis here is another way of meaning two. So now we have two phosphates on a five-membered ring. Look how beautiful that that thing is. That's the definition of symmetry, man. Look at that thing. I mean, the only, the only thing that presents a slight asymmetry is the, the, the stereo positions of the hydroxyl groups. But otherwise, it's beautiful. That right there is a perfect tattoo. You can stick that thing on your back, you know? A big back piece, you know? Whatever. <laughs> uh, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And man, this next step, this is when it gets crazy because we're going to split it. So we have another enzyme here, aldolase, and it's going to break this molecule into two, three carbon entities. Here we have our first. So this is a 3C. I don't know if you can see that up there. I'll try to trace it and make it thicker. And then down here, you have a 3C as well. Again, what I'm using here is 3C, the C stands for carbon. So way over here, 6C, I guess we could identify that this, of course, is a 6C. This, of course, is a 6C. This, of course, is a 6C. And now we have two 3Cs. Makes perfect sense. 3 plus 3 equals 6. 3 plus 3 equals 6. All right. Now this particular step needs some other fun discussion. So you take a look at this molecule here and this molecule here. They're clearly different molecules, but they have the same formula. So they're, is they're isomers. This is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. This is dihydroxyacetone phosphate. But if you add up everything here, all the carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, and then the phosphate group, you're going to end up with the same number here, the same formula as this one, in terms of the, the, the um, molecular formula. But you're going to end up with different, structure, different structures. And of course, that's our definition of isomers. Or isomers. And then we have an enzyme called isomerase that's going to convert the, the, both ways. This is cool. Um, dihydroxyacetone can be converted with this arrow right here into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, whereas glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate through this arrow right here can be converted to dihydroxyacetone phosphate. However, the key is that only glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, this is the one that advances. It has to be glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to keep going in the rest of the story. So let's start the rest of the story. Here it is. So notice, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, as I just mentioned, go up one, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So now we have this arrow going this way. Um, we pick up with glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Oh my, and look how exciting this is. So let's... Whoops, let's go back up and get my pen again. I have to do that every single slide. Pen, please. And here we have a 3C. So glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is a 3-carbon molecule. And now we're going to have our first oxidizing agent. This is so cool because, remember, uh-oh, this needs to have a 2 in front of it, everybody. It doesn't, so I'm putting that in. And remember, it's these, these twos indicate on this half of the process that we have two of everything per glucose. All of these twos that I'm circling represent two per glucose, two per glucose, two per glucose, two per glucose. <laughs> uh, that's that. Okay, so all those twos are important. Now, um, so now back to this business. 
So look what we're going to get. We're going to take two NAD pluses, and we're going to get, and, and take, um, and, and, and we're going to get two NADHs plus two additional hydrogens. You remember that from the previous lecture. But the other thing we got to think about is electrons. Electrons. And then, of course, three exclamation points for this. Um, electrons here. Now, this became reduced. This, therefore, became oxidized. And that's what this is all about. So now we have these high energy electrons. We're going to use those later. We're also going to use these hydrogen atoms uh, as, as a, a, a gradient to drive a process. So this is big, big stuff right here. Um, it's a fabulous enzyme, triose phosphate dehydrogenase. Remember when we talked about dehydrogenases, they remove hydrogens. That's what happened. Count them up. One, two, three, four, five. There's five hydrogens on this thing right here. So that's glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Count them up over here. One, two, three, four. So what we did is that we lost we lost a hydrogen for each one of these things. And of course, there's two. That's what we've got. Um, notice, it, it, this is kind of sneaky. Notice we also have a phosphate here, actually two of them. And now we have phosphorylated this thing again. So there's a phosphorylation. Squeeze that in. Phosphorylation. So we got that going right there. And now we have this bisphosphate. Remember, that means two uh, glycerate. That molecule's starting to show up as fairly symmetrical as well. That's pretty cool. Now, what we're going to do is take one off. And in the process, we're going to get our first. Hey, I need to do something here. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll stay with what I'm at. So, so we're getting ATPs here. We take two ADPs, and we end up with two ATPs. This is huge. This is going to be sub straight. level phosphorylation one more time to write this big word phosphorylation you might remember we talked about two ways to make ATP and those two two, two ways were substrate level phosphorylation and oxidative phosphorylation and that's the one with the fancy ATP synthase and the protons traveling through and generating ATP through chemiosmosis. Well, here, um, this is substrate level phosphorylation, just like we talked about in the first lecture for this series. Okay, notice again, continue to underscore this, two ATPs are made per glucose, just like over here, two NADHs per glucose. So two ATPs per glucose here, two NADHs per glucose. What I think I'm going to do, um, well, I'll, I'll point that out in the next one, we're going to start adding these things up per glucose. All right, from here, it's downhill. Phosphoglyceromutase changes something around. Here we end up losing water. This is a big deal. Look at that. I guess we could call this metabolic water. Metabolic water. We Metabolism has produced this water. <laughs> so we lose, we lose water here. 
molecule, as we talked about in the first lecture, is just getting less and less about hydrogen and more about, less and less about carbon-hydrogen bonds and more and more about carbon-oxygen bonds. Look at this thing. I mean, there's just a couple of hydrogens left by the time you get to, to, to this substrate. And then again, look at here, another set of, whoops, of substrate level phosphorylations. Another set right there. So we've got, we've got substrate level phosphorylation, substrate level phosphorylation, and we finally end up with the end product, which is pyruvate. Pyruvate is the final deal from glycolysis. Okay, now let's move to another screen and I'm going to provide you with uh, kind of the whole view again. And we're going to just focus on cost and gain from that particular thing. Here it is again. So this is the figure that we saw before. The whole thing stretched out. Again, there's, this is a six, 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 six. And then we split into two threes. This is what we've done. And then remember, we convert... To, to, to move forward, you have to be glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So, th so this guy gets di dihydroxyacetone phosphate, gets converted to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and that's the one that goes. Because of that, we identify the twos, and all the twos are indicating that per glucose, there's two of these things happening. So what we're going to do then is identify per glucose. So actually, I'm going to change the colors here and make things right. Okay, so this is going to be our kind of cost and gains per glucose. So per, per glucose, here's the deal. All right, that's a little messy. Maybe I can get better. Per glucose, we're going to have I lost my notes. That's too bad. Got to do this again. All right. Sorry about this. Okay. Per glucose, we're going to have costs we're going to have this and this so those costs would be two ATPs. And then we're going to have gains. Hope you can see that it's a little bit of a light green gains we're going to end up with two NADHs. That's here. And we're going to end up with two plus two, so four ATPs. And I'm not very interested in us gaining water, so I'm going to change that to actually kind of to black. Uh, but we did get two H2Os out of the deal. So this is our story right here. This is our story. Per glucose, in the process of glycolysis, we have spent two ATPs, but we have gained four ATPs and two NADHs, 
So therefore, uh, from, from this part of the story, the net, the net is actually two ATPs, plus, two, actually I'll do NADHs, NADHs, and plus two ATP. All right, there it is. The other thing we need to say is to underscore where this occurs. I didn't even mention that up to this point, and I apologize for that. Glycoly glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm. of the cell. So in the cytoplasm is where this occurs. That is glycolysis. Very, very cool. So now I'm going to shift over to the chalkboard and we're actually going to start to construct the whole process of cellular respiration. That means, of course, it's mitochondria time. We've done this in the cytoplasm. We've got some things. We've got to talk about how those get to where they go and what happens to them. And then we're going to take it all the way down to carbon dioxide and a whole bunch of ATP. This is really, really cool stuff. So there's more PowerPoints in your packet. You want to make sure that you have those. So you can scribble some notes on those as well. But right now, it's note time standard. We're going to the board. So, see you soon. Okay, at this point, get a big piece of paper. I don't know how well I can stick it all on the board, but what we want to do is draw basically half of a mitochondrion on the board and then a little bit of cytoplasm because we're going to identify all five of the acts in one glorious diagram. I mean, if you wanted to do this, uh, you could certainly need a half a piece of paper, perhaps even take one full piece of paper and turn it sideways and do it. So here we go. I'll see if I can get it all on on this board. I'm going to take my red, because that's kind of the mitochondrion color, and draw a bit of mitochondrion. So let's see, here we go. Starting up high. So this is part of a mitochondrion, and therefore this is a double membrane, and then here comes an inner membrane. So there you have it, mitochondrion, outer mitochondrial membrane, inner mitochondrial membrane. I don't have room to label it, but that pretty much looks like it is, right? Matrix right here, intermembrane space right here, cytoplasm here. All right, so I'm going to start in the cytoplasm with act one. So that's going to be Roman numeral. So this is glycolysis. And then right over here, well actually let's just keep with this. So here is the overview. We're going to take glucose and in many steps, matter of fact if you counted them 10, uh, in many steps we're going to end up with one glucose being converted into two pyruvates. two pyruvates, one glucose to two pyruvates. Um, so this is a 6C as we talked about before. These are, th th these are 3Cs, the 3C molecules. 
And what we're going to do with this is we're going to have a, a cost, this is all per glucose by the way, of two ATPs and we're going to have a gain, we're going to have a gain of four ATPs, this is all per glucose, and two NADHs. So <clears throat> that's what we're going to get there. Um, what we have to do now is actually get these pyruvates into the matrix. So here I'm going to take another color, purple it will be, and identify this part of the process. So this is going to be act two, and two is going to be getting, getting the pyruvates getting the pyruvates into the matrix. That's the deal. And remember that this is going to have a cost with it. And this is that part that's hard to find. This is cryptic. It's in a figure caption of your textbook and otherwise not mentioned. But for us, this is what we're focusing on um, is, is that this is going to cost. So I'll write that as a cost of a total of two ATPs per glucose. Okay, now um, we're going to be ready for Act 3, which is going to happen in the matrix, and Act 3 is going to be the oxidation of pyruvate. So the oxidation of pyruvate is our step here. Here we're going to take the two pyruvates, which I'm going to have to abbreviate, and we're going to convert those to two acetyl-CoA's. And we're also going to get out of that two CO2's. Two CO2's so now we've gone actually from 3C molecules to 2C molecules in the acetyl-CoA's. And let's summarize what we've done here. In this oxidation of pyruvate step, therefore, we're going to get the following. 2CO2's. Going to get 2CO2's per glucose. 2 NADH's. And we're going to get two acetyl-CoA's. So all of that stuff, I think I'm going to kind of highlight, put, put that all together as being step three. Oxidation of pyruvate, uh, where we get our two acetyl-CoA's. And I guess I could do it this way. This is kind of the, the line. We get our two acetyl-CoA's out of the deal. So, here's another insert of a PowerPoint slides, so we can really break these parts down. We're going to look, look, we're gonna look now at Act 2 and Act 3, kind of in one slide. We've talked about these on the board. Uh, it, it, we can see things so much better right here that I think we should spend a little bit of time with a PowerPoint slide. So, let's get the lay of the land here for this figure. This is 9.10 on page 171. Here's the cytoplasm, or the cytosol of the cell, and then here's the mitochondrion. Uh, they're actually showing that the, what we need to do is just get into the mitochondrion. So remember, we made the pyruvate in the cytoplasm. And that, of course, is a 3C molecule. One, that's in white, and then two and three, these two are in red, a 3C molecule. Uh, we've we've got to get pyruvate into the mitochondrion. And there's a transport protein involved in this. 
The thing about this that is not mentioned, however, in the in, in the it, specifically in the text, at least not on the figure, it's in the caption of the figure, is that this is going to cost. So remember what we want to do is identify that there are two pyruvates per glucose. So I'm scribbling in the, the number two. So this is two per glucose. And then we've got to get these things in to the mitochondrion. I'm summarizing a lot of steps here, by the way. But right here, just getting them into the mitochondrion. Whoa, come on now. Getting them. Here's my two again. I don't know why that happened, but I apologize. So here's our two. Getting in here actually has a cost. And that cost is going to be that cost to get in there is actually going to be one ATP per pyruvate, meaning two ATPs total. So one AT, I'm writing this right here, not doing a very good job, but that's ATP per pyruvate. which I'm abbreviating. So one ATP per pyruvate, which means two ATPs per glucose. So two per glucose. Man, that's, that's my crappiest pen work already. So this is a very important thing that does not jump out at you in the text. Um, Let's circle that right here. There's a cost here. We'll summarize this cost very clearly later on when I lay all the acts out. But getting those things into the mitochondrion costs. And then what's going to happen is crazy. This is going to be our first in the mitochondrion. In this oxidation of pyruvate step, we're actually going to lose our first CO2. Now, what's a CO2? This is a 1C. So pyruvate is a, two, a, a 3C. We're going to lose a 1C. So I'm trying to write C and 1, 1C. So a 3C becomes a 1C and, look here, a 2C. Boom. Acetyl-CoA is a 2C, a two-carbon molecule. That is awesome. We're going to make acetyl-CoA. And then look at this. We're going to get NADH from this. Now remember, this whole thing gets multiplied by two because we're going to have two pyruvates going in per glucose. We're therefore going to have two NAD pluses that to be reduced to form two NADHs and two H pluses, and we're going to end up with two acetyl-CoAs. Two, 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 two. We have to remember that on a per-glucose basis because what we want to do is do the whole cost and gain scenario for one molecule of glucose. Now I'm going to knock your socks off because I'm going to do some board work. Actually, I'm, I'm going to draw the whole structure of acetyl-CoA. Well, okay. Um, I was drawing that thing. <laughs> and this is acetyl-CoA. I was drawing that thing and a battery ran out. I don't know how much you saw of the construction, but that doesn't matter. Let's point out the important bits. This is a nitrogenous base. It's a purine nitrogenous base. This is a ribose. This is a sugar. These are phosphates. So basically, look at that. That's a nucleotide. You're familiar with that. We use nucleotides in so many different ways. And here then, we have another phosphate group. Boom. And then we have this big chain with cool stuff on it. There's some nitrogens. Here's a couple of carbonyls. Look how this works. And then there's always that S. We kept seeing that S in the PowerPoints. S-CoA. That's the S. That's sulfur. And then here in red is our acetyl group. Two carbons. That's a 2C. We got that from glycolysis. So behold the beauty of acetyl-CoA. This is what we get out of glycolysis, and this is what we're actually going to 
carry forward to introduce these two carbons to the citric acid cycle. Fantastic stuff. Okay, now we're going to move on to Act 4, which is the citric acid cycle. Figure 9.12, page 173. This is the one that shows all of the crazy detail. So you just saw that fabulous molecule, acetyl-CoA. Here it is. And it's coming in. Now again, remember that this thing, we're going we're gonna to follow our carbons like we always do. This thing is a, a 2C. So I've written 2C here. Check this out because it's going to bond with a 1, 2, 3, 4 carbon molecule. So oxaloacetate is a 4 carbon molecule. So 4 plus 2 is going to equal 6. Citrate, that is a 6C molecule. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Six carbons. Count them up. They've even color code the, coded them to show you where they come from. These two blue ones are down here. There's the two from acetyl-CoA. They're there. Um, notice, um, as we go, I think I'm going to continue the carbon identity of all of these substrates all the way around. Now, bear in mind, there's a lot more complexity to this than you would otherwise know. This is in the mitochondrion is where this is occurring, and every one of these steps identified with a blue circle number would actually be an enzyme catalyzed step. Uh, so here we have it. Back to this. A 2C, a 4C, making a 6C. And then we're going to count these guys. Isocitrate is also you can count them, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, a 6C. There's good stuff to talk about, but look here. That's our first loss of, of a carbon, right here, CO2. So that means this is going to be a 5C. Alpha ketoglutarate is a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5C. Then we move over here to succinyl-CoA. Look at here, guys. We lost another CO2 right there. Losing that CO2, of course, is going to peel another one off, and we're going to go to a 4C. So succinyl coenzyme A, boom, 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 is four. There's four carbons right there. Count them. That's going to continue. 4C, succinate, fumarate. There's just modification. Actually, I'll write that right here. So there's fumarate, one, two, three, four. There's malate, one, two, three, four. So there we have it. Everything has been labeled according to its carbon content. A two plus a four equals a six. A six goes to a six. A six goes with the loss of CO2 to a five. The five loses the CO2 to become a four, and then four, 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 up and around. All right, that's big, that's huge. Now what we need to do is break into identifying what we're getting out of this process. Look over here. Here we're getting an NADH. So maybe I change that to green just to kind of highlight the get. So there's our green. So here we're getting an NADH and an hydrogen. We're also getting CO2s. We're getting NADH here. So this is that Th that extraordinary process that we talked about in the first installment of this incredible week of getting NADH. Um, and so, so which means high energy electrons and hydrogen. Oh boy, look at this. This is crazy down here. Now we have down here ATP. Then, for the first time ever, we're going to get FADH2. It's the first time. So we get that. And then we continue to go and we get more NADH up here. So look at all these gain circles. We've got NADH here. We've got NADH here. 
We've got ATP here, FADH2 here, NADH. What we need to do, however, is, is, is remember that this is going to happen two times per glucose. So two of these cycles per glucose, so then we can actually do our summary. So let's start off then. Let's do our gains from this. We don't have any costs. So I'm writing right here the gains from the process. And remember, it's going to be two cycles per glucose. Two cycles per glucose. So, changing to red pen, let's get this thing done. Or, wait, not red pen, green pen, sorry. This is gain. All right, so per glucose, we're going to get one, two, three times two. So we're going to get a total of six NADHs. NADHs. We're also going to get two ATPs. Again, two cycles. You get one per cycle. Two ATPs. There we go. Looks a little bit better. So two ATPs. Six NADHs, two ATPs. And let's keep the party going. We're going to get our first FADHs. Two per cycle. So two F. A, D, H, twos. <laughs> oh, this is great. And we can't forget about CO2. So every cycle is going to give two per step. There's two steps that generate it. So we're going to get four CO2s. Four CO2s. Breathe some out. That's what's coming out of you. You're making it. Four CO2s. Wow, this is huge. This is huge. Okay, so that is all, well, actually, maybe I could say a couple of things more about the citric acid cycle. Um, I think that, that if you were to look up the names of the enzymes for this process, you would find out that every one of these steps here would be associated with a dehydrogenase. This is not even in the book, but this thing here, um, the, the enzyme catalyzed step, actually, I should, this guy right here, this is by a dehydrogenase. And it's got a specific name, by the way. Uh-oh, I don't know how well I'm doing. I'm squeezing it in. So I'm writing the word dehydrogenase right here. That's a dehydrogenase. Then this is a dehydrogenase and this over here is a dehydrogenase. So I've identified three enzyme catalyzed steps that are catalyzed by dehydrogenase enzymes. Fantastic. This thing just churns and churns and churns. Location, mitochondrial matrix. So all of this thing, uh, we haven't done the, is that, so let's talk about where it happens. This thing is in, in the matrix. In the matrix. Behold, the fabulous citric acid cycle. Four, number four is the citric acid cycle. Citric acid cycle. I don't have as much space here, so I'm trying to sneak this in because chalk is chalk, you know. <laughs> so here's the citric acid cycle, starting with acetyl CoA, and what we're going to end up with the acetyl CoA in that process of the citric acid cycle is four CO2s. And CO2s, by the way, are 1Cs. So 6C, 3C, 2C, 1C. 
and uh, we'll have two acetyl-CoA's becoming a to total of four CO2's. We get gain here. Here's the gain. The gain is going to be four CO2's. The gain is going to be two ATP's. The gain is going to be six NADH's. And the gain is going to be 2FADH2. Of course, all of this stuff we carefully went over in the PowerPoint slide. That uh, so, so, so you can see this. All right. So I'm going to actually put a little circle around that to kind of identify that that is the information that goes with that step. Get, and uh, we've got one more thing to do. So I'm going to draw here in our membrane going to draw some enzymes in the membrane that are going to show us that things are happening. You can even put a few other factors here. And then I'm going to draw that flask. Whoops, I drew it wrong. This flask. So there's our ATP synthase. And this sets us up over in this part of the board to get our final step, which is number five which is the electron transport chain. Electron transport chain. And this is what's going to happen. Let's find yet another color. I don't know if blue's the one we need. So here's what's going to happen. We're going to take all NADHs and FADHs. I'm going to circle them wherever they live. And these substances are actually all collectively going to... I'm going to make a little doorway here. Collectively, these NADHs pass through transporters here and they go up to the electron transport chain. These are already in the matrix, so they go straight to the electron transport chain, straight to the electron transport chain, and Let's see how to do this one straight to the electron transport chain. So here we have all of these products that are going here to do their thing. And what we're going to have happening is H+. Plus. H+. Plus and H+. Plus. We're making a gradient, as you've seen. So this is integral in the inner membrane of the mitochondria, and we're making this, this H plus gradient, and we're doing that with these high energy electrons driving pumps through electron transport. We also saw a PowerPoint slide to kind of summarize that process. Not really getting into the specifics and the names of the components, but just identifying, hey, these electrons are driving this, and watch that H plus go into the intermembrane space. Boom, that's what we've got. So, now we have this huge concentration gradient, and because of that, all of these H pluses here, all of these H pluses are going to go flooding down and th th through, the, through the process, are going to drive this process. And of course, what we will get from that is this. We're going to get ADP plus PI going to form A. TP. That is what we get. That is extraordinary. So here we have Act 5. Man, we've done a lot. And I want you to think about all the things that we've generated for this process. We've got a lot of NADHs. Specifically, we talk about the numbers on the board. We have FADH2s. But the figure in the book just shows the general phenomenon. What we're going to do, we've got electrons from the food. We also have hydrogens. And in this electron transport chain, let's get the lay of the land as we've done before. So here we have the matrix in the lighter color, not labeled. So this is the matrix of the mitochondrion right here. Here's our mitochondrial inner membrane, phospholipid bilayer, like we saw before. Here is the intermembrane space that's in the darker orange color up here. Then I'm not even going to identify these kind of integral proteins, but it's a, basically called a protein complex of electron carriers. We've got other things here. I'm going to keep this very, very brief and not specific, 
uh, because what I want to do is uh, show you a similar phenomenon in photosynthesis where we're actually going to name the parts. Here we just want to look at the general phenomenon. NADH is coming in and it's going to basically use electron energy to pump H plus out of the matrix into the intermembrane space. And then FADH2 actually comes in later um, and both of these actually have electron energy that actually drives a, another um, pump that pumps protons, that pumps H plus from the matrix to the intermembrane space. And then continuing on down, we even have one last step, which also involves the use of O2. That's super, super important right there. This is the O2 part that, uh, and, and we're going to actually drive more H plus out. And of course, what do we do with that H plus? Well, I've got to slide all the way to the top of the, of, of the show. This is what we're going to do with all that H plus. So this doesn't show it. Um, we would actually have lots and lots of H pluses here, more than we have. H plus. H plus. A concentration gradient that was made by that. This is what we talked about before. This is going to be this, uh, this is going to set up this chemiosmosis that's going to drive this process. We talked about this where all these H pluses go down concentration gradient, very, very impressively generating the energy uh, that ends up being transformed into the chemical energy of ATP by chemiosmosis. This is huge. So, there we have it. You can put the whole thing together now. We've got everything that we need. One other thing we need to try to sneak in here is that right here, with this last step, we're actually going to take H plus, H plus, so that's H plus, plus one half of an O2, and that goes to form H2O. That is really, really, really important. Um, this part right here. It's really important. That's the, 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 that's the oxygen process, the aerobic process. This is cellular respiration. This is aerobic respiration. And remember what happens, or I'm going to tell you, excuse me, I'm going to tell you what happens uh, when the oxygen supply is dwindling and what it does to this whole process. So, if there's no oxygen or reduced oxygen in the system, acetyl-CoA does something radically different. It, it doesn't end up entering the Krebs cycle. In the case of yeasts, which are unicellular fungi, uh, and there's other things that do this as well. Uh, you can take a look at this figure 9.17a on page 180 and you can see what happens if there's no O2. So I need to write that here with my pen. Let's check my pen color. Okay, good. So I'm going to write right here. Um, so no O2. Okay. If there's no O2, or O2 becomes restricted, then here's what happens. We still have glycolysis making two ATPs per glucose. We already talked about that. That's normal. And then we end up with that, of course, with two pyruvates. We also make two NADHs and two H pluses, and we've got electrons here. So all of that stuff is the stuff that you're familiar with. We've made two pyruvates, we've made two ATPs per glucose and two NADHs per glucose. But without the O2, here's what happens. We lose a CO2. Think of that CO2 in alcohol fermentation. I mean, that's, go drink a beer. Or go and prepare like, like bake some bread. The yeast, the rising CO2 is what's making that happen. Wow, that is so cool. So we got CO2 breaking off per glucose, meaning that we've got 2C here, 
So this is a 3C, this is a 2C, this is a 2C called acid aldehyde, and it's not done there because it's going to regenerate its NAD plus um, by, by, by basically this reduction step that's going to end up making two ethanols. So here's what we've got. Two CO2s per glucose, two ethanols per glucose, only in the grand process, only two ATPs. Low, low energy yield, but we make ethanol, we make CO2, and what you think about right here, if you want to put it together, A plus B equals beer. That's it. A plus B equals beer. Ethanol and CO2. That's it, man. Alcohol fermentation. Now, we are making our own alcohol in our own bodies. We do something different when our O2 is in decline. We do what's called lactic acid fermentation. So again, glucose in the cytoplasm undergoes glycolysis. Again, yielding for that part, act one, two ATPs and two NADHs. So all that happens, and we make our pyruvate. We want to identify, of course, that the pyruvates, so oopsie, we want to identify that the pyruvates, let's get my pen, are three C's, carbon, 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 three of them. So those are three C's right there. And then we're going to use a, we're going to, we're going to have an NAD plus regeneration process that actually converts this per glucose to two to two lactate. I don't know what's going on here. Two lac. Okay, this is just fun today. Okay, two lactates. Remember that the ATE ending is kind of the shorthand nomenclature ending for something that really means acid. And of course, you can see that. I guess I should point that out. Look at that man. That is a dissociated carboxyl. That's your old functional group right there. Boom. It's dissociated, so it's already lost its hydrogen in that particular in this particular scenario, but two lactates per glucose. So again, when we do this, and of course in our tissues this would happen if we're basically demanding way too much oxygen for our cardiovascular system. So we're really working out, we're sprinting, and this is what kicks in. We get two ATPs per glucose instead of the massive yield that we're going to get if we have oxygen. And that is the next part of our story. What we want to do now is actually, uh, actually do one more thing. I need to tell you about this. This process here to get these NADHs in is done with electron shuttles. So this thing right here that I've drawn through the two membranes, electron shuttles. That's how NADH gets in there. So what we're going to do now is take a look at the overall process then. It's all here on the board. So we're going to do overall ATP. Overall ATP. So what I'm going to do in this process is make a table. Here's our step, whoops, um, our act. Here's our act. Here is our cost. And here's our gain. So, one, two, three, four, and five, and then we'll be able to do some totals here, and uh, we're going to get costing two, costing two, no cost, no cost, no cost, we're going to gain four, we're going to gain two, and then down here, this is the crazy one, 34. <laughs> 34, 34 right here. This is the 34 part. 
maybe I should do that. 34 of those guys right there, so we get our whole tally. So here we have a total of 40 uh, gained per glucose. Here we have a total of 4 cost, and therefore our net is going to be plus 36 ATPs. Per glucose. Boom. And that, my friends, is the best small board that I can make. That is where it's at. Just celebrate it for a moment. Breathe in some O2. Breathe out some CO2. It's right there. This is cool. <laughs> All right, so the last thing that we're going to say about this entire process is the regulation of the process. We just don't have these kind of mad, crazy glucose demolition factories in our cells that always are operating. They actually are controlled. There's, there's inhibition, there's feedback. And if you go to figure 9.20 on page 183, we're going to talk about the regulation of cellular respiration. So this is the whole thing, familiar process. Here's glucose up at the top. Here's glycolysis. You know about that. That's in the cytoplasm. And then in glycolysis, which is this entire blue box, we actually have several feedbacks, several places where we can, sh where we can shut down or turn on the process. If we have a lot of AMP, that means that we don't have a lot of ATP. That's going to actually stimulate the enzyme phosphofructokinase. What an enzyme, man. Say that fast three times. Phosphofructokinase. Um, matter of fact, uh, you could easily curse if you say that fast three times. So phosphofructokinase is turned on, stimulated by AMP, whereas phosphofructokinase, which is the major regulatory enzyme in glycolysis, is actually inhibited by ATP. So downstream, if we're making way too much ATP, we can turn off phosphofructokinase, and therefore we're not going to end up making this fructose 1,6-bisphosphate in glycolysis. And that's the end of the road until the whole thing balances out. Uh, we also have the citric acid cycle, and if it makes too much citrate, then it's going to inhibit phosphofructokinase as well. So it's all about phosphofructokinase, isn't it? This is fabulous. So that's regulation of cellular respiration. And that is where we're going to end chapter 9. Wow, what amazing stuff. All right, here's some jobs for you now. The jobs based on this week. Jobs to do. I think that you have some optional homework. And this, of course, is chapter 9. You actually have a quiz. And again, the deadline is way in May, but you might want to study this and get it up into your system and then take a quiz on it. And then I think you want to work your notes with the text. So basically, improve your notes. Um, get notes right you know and work with the book those are your jobs for this week and then next week we'll pick up with photosynthesis which is extraordinary in its own right so these are really exciting times and I hope you guys can engage in that and then I guess your last job, of course, as always right now in this crazy world, is to stay healthy. <laughs> That's it. See you next week.